considering that the church and, 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 and the people of God, the body of Christ, are the conscience of the nation, how bad is it when you have liberal mainliners who aren't saved, who go out promoting all the wickedness of the world in the name of Christ? How much more when liberal neo-evangelicals, who even some of them are saved, buy into the me mental and emotional manipulation of the godless, wicked society to promote uh, a moderated form of wickedness? No wonder this great falling away will allow a wicked ruler to rise up because everything's going to go to hell in a handbasket to proceed. So what's the solution? You know what the solution is? To the Great Commission. Go and teach all nations. You know, that means, you want to you know what the cure to racism is? Hey, you want to know what the cure to racism is? Go and knock on doors and find how black people are far more receptive to the gospel than white people. Yeah, you're going to thank God for a black person answering that door sometimes. You know what I mean? That is the cure. And also, uh, my, my Bible says that there's neither Greek nor Jew, slave nor bond, male nor female, nor, uh, nor Hebrew, nor Scythian, nor German, nor Kraut, nor Polish, nor African, nor Russian, nor Chinese, nor Japanese, nor Korean, uh, uh, nor Ethiopian, uh, nor Ugandan, nor Indian, uh, nor Eskimo, that we're all one in Christ. That's what it says in the original Greek, okay? The following message has been brought to you by Independent Baptist Church of Tampa Bay. BaptistTampaBay.com It's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Alright, so uh, today I am preaching a sermon that I did not want to preach, okay? Uh, I was talking to a brother up in New Jersey and uh, he, he likes my preaching. I, I, I bless his heart. What a generous fellow, right? <laughs> and uh, he asked me to do a sermon about the riots. So God's calling a nation out to himself, a peculiar nation, from all nations set apart, okay? And as, we, as the time gets closer and closer to these last days, unfortunately, I can't tell. I don't have a special gift of revelation. I can't tell you when everything is going to happen and exactly how, but I can take you into this word and I can show you from this word how to be on guard when you see demonic forces. But just remember something, okay? Uh, my Bible says there is nothing new under the sun. Uh, the, devil, the devil has a bag of tricks, and through different ages, he's always going to be pulling different tricks out of that bag. So... As the times wax worse and worse, we're going to be seeing time move faster almost as these dirty tricks seem to all happen at once. And I can't go through and preach to you every single thing. But again, I didn't even want to preach this sermon tonight. I, uh, Brother Andy, was a month, month, Sunday or Monday you asked me that I suggest that I should preach one. Uh, and I didn't want to do it. I, and on Tuesday, I was still planning to come in tonight and resume in 1 Corinthians 10, part 3. Uh, but unfortunately, God convicted me. And I, and I said, God, if there's peace tonight, back to normal. But when you've got riots going on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday night, look up here. The moral conscience of the nation is the fundamental pulpit. And it's time to let her rip, brother. Uh, so also, why? We have to contend for the faith. My Bible says, uh, be always ready to give an account for the joy that is within you. My Bible says, study to show yourself approved. We have to have a biblical worldview. You see, there's only one source of truth, and that is the Bible. There are other facts outside the Bible, but you're not going to know what to do with those facts if you don't put your Bible goggles on and wipe those things up, you know, which is the, you know, abiding in the Spirit to be able to view the world's events through a biblical worldview. Also, uh, false doctrines will otherwise prevail. You know, what's the old saying? Uh, it, a lie makes it around the world ten times before the truth has a chance to put on its britches. And uh, as the times wax worse and worse, we're going to see more false prophets, and they're going to have bigger platforms. So if we don't take this opportunity, brother, I mean, what good are we? Good night. 
Uh, also, I, I want to just go ahead and zero in on the text that we're working through here. Let's go to uh, 2 Thessalonians uh, verses 2 and 3, where it says, That ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand, speaking about in Paul's day. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Okay, so that great day is not going to come until this great falling away in this and the big Antichrist is revealed. We always have Antichrist with us, okay? Well, not with us here. We'll kick him out of church in a New York <laughs> minute, Big Daddy. But at the same time, they're always going to be around, okay? Now, but that being said, the big one, the man of sin, the son of perdition, big Antichrist in all caps. You know, uh, we're, we have to be ready for that. We have to know what we're looking at when we're looking at it. And uh, also, we have to deal with these issues because uh, even in Apostle Paul's day, there were counterfeit letters that were going out claiming that Apostle Paul had said it had already come. No, it hadn't come. Don't be stupid. Apostle Paul's writing to him and said, hey, I was already with y'all and told y'all this. You, what are you going to believe? Maybe are the letters. Look, here's a real letter. Read it again, buddy. All right, so that's what we're doing again. Uh, we're just going to kind of drill this stuff into our heads because as the times approach, I want y'all to be ready so we know what we're looking at. Because even in Apostle Paul's day, there were deceivers that he had to deal with this stuff. Uh, so I want to go ahead over into First Corinthians chapter. I'm sorry, First Thessalonians chapter five, and uh, preach through verses one through seven uh, to wrap up this introduction. Uh, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety. Then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Hey, look up here. You know, th th there were some patriotic deists who understood the Bible better than a lot of theologians. Because was it Benjamin Franklin or Thomas Jefferson who said, I think it was Benjamin Franklin, he who trades liberty for security deserves none and will have none, okay? I mean, that's the application here. You know, oh, well, I just want to be safe. Oh, as long as I can go to work. No! You've got to get right with God. You see, my Bible says all things work together for good for them who love God. Hallelujah. You see, so even when everything's falling on around you, you know that God's got a hedge of protection. God has a plan for you. And if you're abiding in the Spirit and not abiding in the flesh, God's going to have some great stuff for you to do in these times. Hey, look up here. I mean, we were fledgling up here, you know, and then uh, as times got worse and worse, I was like, you know what? We're going to be the Bubba Gum Church Company, and we're going to keep on going when all the other church ships sink in, the, in Mobile Bay. You know what? And God brought the increase. God has done amazing things at this church in just a few months because we stayed the course. None of us got sick. None of us died. I didn't even have to go to jail. Praise God. You see, but I didn't, we didn't get this blessing by saying peace and safety, big, big hoss. We got this blessing because we believed God. Uh, verse 4, but ye brethren are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all children of the light and the children of the day. We are not the children of night nor of darkness. You see that? We're not going to go out rioting at night, okay? We're not going to go out burning down the champ station and stealing all the Nikes, bless God. We're going to go be at home at night with our guns and our Bibles. Well, let me just put it this way. We trust in God, but we also trust God that the bullet's going to, that the bullet's going to shoot at what you're shooting at if you've got a looter at your door, bless God. Amen right there? Amen. Hallelujah! Yes, so with that being said, we don't go out at night. We don't cause trouble at night. Even if we have to go out at night, look up here. It's because we're on the way back from somewhere, on the way home. It's because we're just winding down our day, 
providing for the family and getting home. You see, we don't go out and do recreation at night. Nightclubs are straight out of hell. You see, if you want to get yourself a good meal, you go out and just go out and eat a good meal during the daytime. And let me just tell you something here. You're not going out for a good meal at night. You know how I know that? Because most of the places that are still open are only going to serve you like uh, fried mushrooms and french fries because they need to be able to let you smoke cigarettes while you get drunk, okay? You can like that or you can love that. But go out, if you, if you get the munchies at night, you know what? Plan ahead and fill your refrigerator, okay? God's blessed you with a microwave, okay? Go use it, bless God. Uh, where did I leave off? Verse 6, Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. So you see, don't, don't let your... You've got to exercise that gift of discernment. You've got to be watching things. Don't go to mental spiritual sleep. Always be contending for the faith. Always be learning. Always looking for an opportunity to witness. And always looking for the signs of when the devil's moving, whether it be a little fulfillment of prophecy or a big end times fulfillment of prophecy, bless God. Verse 7, For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. All right, so yeah, don't be drunk. It's straight out of hell. It's horrible. Don't do it. All right, woo, I almost lost my sermon. All right, so anyway, uh, moving right along, I want to go ahead and just get into some general principles here uh, because I don't want to leave any confusion or any doubt where I stand on these things, and more importantly, what the Bible has to say about these things. So first off, all these, th all these events were supposedly in response to uh, the murder of George Floyd, okay, up in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Okay, so first off, it's not, a, it's, not, it's not something to just beat up on Republicans about because Amy Klobuchar, the Democrat senator from Minnesota, let the cop off uh, for doing something similar, and now he just did it again, okay? That's the first thing. The second thing is people of all races, all nationalities, all ages, all genders— get beat up by cops all the time, okay? It's, if, if they act illegally, they should be punished harshly. And if you look at the, at the Bible, particularly Ephesians has a lot of this, where someone is in a position of power and someone is in a position of subordination or submission to that power, God always has far stronger warnings, far stronger rebukes, and far stronger condemnations for those who abuse power as opposed to those who refuse uh, to properly submit to the power over them, okay? So I want to get that out of the way. And also this George Floyd thing, look up here. This isn't another one of those hoaxes. He was murdered, okay? So if you got a man down on the ground who's not moving and you have one knee over his carotid artery right here, carotid arteries right here that controls the blood flow to the brain, and his head, his head sideways in such a way that you're also leaning on the part of the where the spine connects to the brain. Is that the medulla oblongata or whatever? I don't know. But, I mean, that is, that's a horrible position to be. You're going to cut off blood circulation to the brain. And then the other knee is on the lung, suffocating the man, okay? You don't, and you don't get into that position by accident. And you don't stay in that position unless you're a murderer. Okay, but I mean the man has been arrested and he will be tried and nobody's sympathetic to this because it's obvious what we were looking at. Okay, I want to get that out of the way so you don't mistake anything else that we're about to get into uh, as it gets harder as it goes along. Okay, all right, so that, that being said, uh, equal justice under the law is a biblical principle. Equal justice under the law is a biblical principle. We see that in the book of Leviticus, uh, chapter 19, and verse 15 says, Ye shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty, but in righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. So whenever you are a judge... Whenever you are a lawyer, whenever you are a boss, whenever you are an employer hiring someone, you judge righteously. You don't have preferences. 
You see, uh, I mean, you, you hear so much about a line that, that we have to bring equality. You see, we, there's a difference between equality of opportunity and equality of result. It, it's not a sin to be rich. It's a sin to be greedy and to love money, okay? Uh, I mean, I, I, I think the best example of this is your dad, who God blessed him abundantly, and he invested in God's work. And I praise God for him. Now, with that being said, but I mean, just in matters of justice. So it doesn't matter if you're, it, you know, uh, like the Dusty Rhodes song says, if you are black or white, redneck, funky, that's all right. Because look up here. It doesn't matter which poor, no matter what your ethnicity, race, age, gender is, you deserve, you do the crime, you do the time. No, regardless, God's not a respecter of persons. That's my Bible. And also, you're not right with God. You're wicked. You're a wicked ruler who God will judge and condemn if you have different standards of judgment for different people. And look, I mean... This country is not true capitalism right now because they're paying congressmen and legislators to pick the winners and losers. And as we see with this economic downturn right now, God's going to find a way to knock you down the peg. If, if you don't have a righteous judge in the nation, God will be that righteous judge sooner or later. Uh, all right, so also I want to point out something else here. Uh, Exodus twelve forty nine says... One law shall be to him that is homeborn and unto the stranger that sojourneth among you. You see that? So there were, there were strangers. They were foreigners who were going to be walking through the nation of Israel, okay? These foreigners, these strangers, were going to be coming through Israel. They were going to be sojourning in Israel. They might even be living with Israelites, citizens of Israel. And you see what? They were all entitled to the same protections under the law as the people of Israel. They were all entitled to take the Passover feast if they believed in God the same way, whether you were a stranger or a native. Uh, they were all fa to face the same punishment for crimes, whether it were a native or a foreigner. God's not a respecter of persons. Uh, it, this is not a new concept, folks. And I mean, in, in this thing that all that, that, that every racial Jew was saved and that every person who was a Gentile was damned, that's not an Old Testament concept because it talks about how sojourners were coming and celebrating these Passover feasts and honoring God. Uh, Jonah went to Nineveh to lead people to Christ. Rahab the redeemed Canaanite. I'm not calling her Rahab the harlot because God got her right. Bless God. Hallelujah. But, I mean, this is, and also, uh, people, even in Moses' day, were going to hell, like Korah, who hell itself opened up its mouth and swallowed the devil. Uh, we, we saw this in the days of Elijah, where it was so wicked, but God reserved himself a remnant. There will always be a remnant. You know, there's, there are always going to be ethnic Jews who get saved and get completed by believing their Messiah. And in the same way, even as we in a Christian nation are falling away, God will always reserve himself a remnant here. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Let's go ahead and look at the Ten Commandments here because this is important to understand. Let's go ahead and test what's going on today by the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. Uh, Exodus chapter 20, and we'll start off in verse 3. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. You know what? If, if, if you love stuff, if you love money, if you love smut more than you love God, that is idolatry. That's having a God before God. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water underneath. You know what? So, if someone's in hell, don't make a statue of them. <laughs> Uh, don't make a statue of what you believe God to look like. And also, you know what? God made the Ark of the Covenant, okay? Uh, I really would, in theory, love to have a, a little relic, a little tinker, you know, knick-knack of the Ark of the Covenant. But I can't do it because 
I mean, there was one Ark of the Covenant that God made, and maybe it's the same one, or uh, maybe it's a different one. That's a, a matter of debate. You can be a good, godly, safe, smart person and believe either way. But either way, that thing's in heaven. You don't need to be making relics of it. It's nice to have a little illustration, know what it looks like, but I mean, don't have that stuff sitting around. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third or fourth generation of them that hate me. So, like with that, I mean, it's if you, you can be a good Christian and have that stuff, it's like the Ark of the Covenant thing, really? It's a dangerous thing because, I mean, it's a matter of interpretation. I recommend against it. But at the same time, now, if you've got statues of wicked people who are burning in hell, I mean, that's like a, a bad spirit that's in your house that's going to provoke you to emulate that person. And how much even worse to actually bow down and worship these stupid things. I mean, don't even... I highly recommend you don't even give yourself the opportunity. Verse 6, And showing mercy unto thousands of them that loved me and keep my commandments, thou shalt not take... Uh, the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. So, isn't it sick that today that, 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 that they don't block out people saying GD, you know, or they'll say Jesus' name is a cuss word? Why don't they ever say, oh, Obama? Why don't they ever say, oh, Muhammad? Why don't they ever say, oh, fat Buddha? Why don't they ever say, oh, skinny, skinny man bun Buddha? Why don't they ever say any of this? Because there is some sick energy in them, sick spirit in them, that wants to blaspheme the one who they know is the one true God. Verse 8, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Okay, look, the Sabbath has changed, okay? You know what? Uh, Stonewall Jackson, even when he was in battle, he, was, he didn't always have Sundays off, which is the Lord's day, uh, just as the Old Testament Saturday was the Sabbath day. But he would always have a day set apart for God. God wants you to have a day of rest. God doesn't want you to work yourself to death. And, but give yourself that day of rest and keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath day of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. So don't take a job that prevents you from being in church because you're wicked if you're telling a godly person to go to work instead of going to church. And if you say, oh, God gave me this job, I can't make it to church anymore. God didn't give you that job. Stop lying to yourself, bless God. Verse 11, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the, and the sea and that uh, and all that is uh, in them and rested the seventh wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it uh, so again uh, in Hebrews uh, Apostle Paul said not to told the Hebrews not to judge a man in regards to the Sabbath it didn't mean you didn't set apart a day for God it just mean that hey look up here Jesus rose on the first day of the week so instead of Saturday we're doing it on Sundays now hallelujah uh, verse 12, honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. So you know what? If, if mama tells you not to do drugs and drink alcohol, listen. If mama tells you not to go down and burn down the city and steal a bunch of Nikes, do it. Do, do what mama said. And you know what? If you don't have a godly mother and a godly father who are going to who are going to tell you what not to do and, and rebuke you and discipline you, you know what? You've got a heavenly Father who's going to tell you these things. You listen to God. And if, and, if, and if anything anybody tells you, whether it be mom, dad, husband, wife, teacher, employer, even the preacher tells you anything that's not biblical, the book, the book, it's superior to all, the book, thou shalt not kill. Man, I was watching this. It was sick. These rioters had, there was a, 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 a black man who was a family man, a good man who had been in the St. Louis Police Department for decades and was retired. And he was urging these rioters not to burn down somebody's business. And they killed him dead on the street. Heartbreaking. Yeah, black lives matter. I agree with that. That black life mattered. 
What about him? Uh, the black lives that are in the womb that are being murdered in abortion clinics, those black lives matter. Why don't you care about those black lives? All lives matter. God is not a respecter of persons. And don't let anybody use a hashtag on you or a catchphrase on you that's going to make you afraid to defend righteousness because you can just as easily turn it around on them with the word of God and the facts of the case and prove that what's good is good and what's wicked is wicked. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Gangster rap. Man, they're always glorifying adultery. The sick, disgusting movies are always glorifying adultery. Thou shalt not steal. That's pretty simple. Those Nikes aren't yours. Leave them on the shelf. You didn't pay for those. That building is not yours. You're stealing that person's livelihood by burning down that building. That's not yours to do. Uh, don't steal that. You know what? That even applies to all of us because we're all without sin. You know what? If you go into work and you don't give it your best and you just want to like sit around and play Pokemon Go, you just want to sit around and play your little uh, call of call of hootie duty or whatever you call it, look up here. You are stealing from your employer because your employer paid you to do a job, okay? I'm going to get to the employer thing in a minute here. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. You know what? If you're accusing people, uh, an entire society, of an injustice, you are lying. If you are accusing a cop of doing something they didn't do, you are lying. Look, but your sin's going to find you out. Just look at that murderer up in Minnesota who, who was a cop and who will go to prison. You see, don't bear false witness. You know, let justice play out. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Uh, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. All right, praise God. You know what? This is really important. And I'm not speaking from a higher, higher than thee, holier than thou kind of mindset here. I'm speaking from experience. We know, everybody here knows I'm open about this. You've seen it. I had a horrible leg injury in December. My right knee was swollen up three times the size of my left knee. I was bedridden, had an ambulance ride, had internal bleeding, uh, dealing with some of the pain relievers. Uh, it was, I was a mess, okay? I couldn't do my security job. The Bible does say, he who does not work does not eat. Now, I never, I mean, I never gave up faith in God through all this time. And God did give me healing through those tendon injuries. And I'm able to go out and walk now in limited doses. God provided me a new job. Uh, all things work together for good for them that love God. God provided me a new job. And I was very open with them about this. You see, you see... Some people are smarter than others. Some people are more able-bodied than others. Some people are faster than others. Some people have different talents, okay? Give it your best. You see, I go into that job. I show up, I show up on time. I leave when I'm supposed to leave. I have a good attitude. And I even just try to go above and beyond because I say, look, I'm not asking for any, any commitments here. But I know there's upward mobility in this place. I know you're very busy because of the situation. Let me have a little, could you, if you could show me some of this stuff to do, uh, I'll help relieve you of some of your duties, you know, the stuff that you don't need to be doing. You see, you go above and beyond. You, you do what's right in the workplace. You find the job that's there for you. You be open and honest about your limitations, and you give it your best. You faithfully serve your employer, and you will move up. I mean, God has been really good to me because I went in there with the right attitude. I was very honest about my physical limitations that I'm still working through, and they're teaching me to do other stuff. They're like management duties, okay? And that being said, look, no company who deals with the public wants to be stigmatized with the mark of racism or sexism, okay? Uh, they want to bring in people who relate to people, okay? And don't get all holier than thou, higher than mighty and everything and all that, and say that, oh, I can't do that because of these work circumstances. Look, when I started the job, we always had clients coming in who wanted me to laugh at their dirty jokes 
and who wanted to talk to me about their liver, okay? I can't do that. You see, I got a higher call and I got a higher job. That's this pulpit. But at the same time, I needed to make a living. You can find ways to use your brain and get right with God to find your way out of these situations. So I have this big Thompson chain reference Bible, large print, size of a big family Bible. You literally got to hold it right under here like that, right? So every single place I go in my shoot job, I'm carrying around this great big Thompson chain reference Bible. Nobody's coming to me with, nope, never, ever since I started doing that, not a single person has told me a dirty joke, and not a single person has told me about their liquor. Use your brain, okay? There's ways to get around your atmosphere, okay? Oh, and by the way, don't take your work home with you. When you punch out, you punched out, okay? You, you don't need to burden your family with what you're going on there. You go to work to make a living, and you give it all to family. You give it all to God. Uh, you give it all to your family on, for God's sake because God told you to. But that's there's ways around that, okay? That was, that was a long way through that, but it, it, that's, that's something I had to learn the hard way over time, and I want to share that with you. All right, so uh, let's go ahead over to J James chapter 3 to see what exactly all this racial tension does uh, to the body of Christ. Verse 16. Uh, by the way, just a little game I want you to play. Look up all the three 16s in the Bible. And you're going to find there's a lot of really interesting verses that are marked 316. It's, it's really good. Try it sometime. Uh, James 316. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Okay? This is talking about inside the body of Christ. Inside the church of Jerusalem. Okay? That was pastored by James, the brother of Jesus. Now, uh, in this case, you see... The, the Jewish brethren were, were not willing to take care of the Gentile widows. And that's why they had to appoint the deacons, was to do that. And they, they were strongly rebuked because that was wicked. Where and There was not even any reason for the Gentile brethren to believe the Jew, Jewish brethren were saved because they weren't acting like it, okay? It, it, that's, that, that's what the justification by, uh, is not man justified by works. You're just, justified means to be declared righteous. They were declared righteous by their, by before man, were declared righteous by our works. You know, before God, we're, we're justified by faith. You've got to rightly divide that. But that being said here, I want to zero in on something. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Okay? You, you see this in major denominations, even in local churches, where, uh, like I think of the Southern Baptist Convention, where they are pushing a hardcore social justice, where their political entity, uh, the ERLC, is pushing social justice, supporting Black Lives Matter, uh, refusing to rebuke Antifa. The, all the denominational leaders signed a statement about George Floyd, but didn't even mention rioting, let alone condoning it. Uh, J.D. Uh, Greer, the president of the convention, condemns every racial incident that comes up that like Al Sharpton, the liberal news media, jump on, but he, but it's always very selective. And he never apologizes when he gets exposed as being wrong. And there is so much tension where even young pastors are going into churches and telling people that, oh, well, uh, you, you have the same, you white have the same last name as you black, so you white go apologize to, to you black for slavery. That is such wickedness. That's such tension. That's sowing envy and strife. I mean, so you're sowing envy and strife based off of race, based off of income, based off of what happened hundreds of years ago. And you wonder why these people only care about violence that fits their narrative. It's because when you are a respecter of persons, you're not, at, you're, you're not right with God. You're acting in a spirit contrary to God. You see, and, and all this, look, you know what? This rioting is wicked, is literally wicked as hell. Literally, the flames of hell are spouting out of the earth. It just, just as a testimony of how evil this is. But at the same time, if anybody in this church came in here and wanted to mistreat someone based off of their race, 
I'll kick you out of here in a New York minute, Big Daddy. You'll be out of here. Because this, any normal person, and especially any godly person, will weep and be grieved regardless of race or gender or nationality for any wicked crime that befalls an innocent person or especially an innocent brother or sister in Christ. Job chapter 24 has a little bit to say about all this. Job chapter 24, and we will start reading in verse 13. This is talking about evil that works its way at the night. Job 24, verse 13. They are those that rebel against the light. They know not the ways thereof, nor abide in the past thereof. You see, they're given over to spiritual darkness, which is why they have their fun in physical darkness. The murderer rising with the light killeth the poor and needy, and in the night is as a thief. The eye of the adulterer waiteth for the twilight, saying, No eye shall see me and disguise his face. The dark they dig through houses, which they had marked for themselves in the daytime. They know not the light, for the morning is as to them, even as the shadow of death. If one know them, they are in the terrors of the shadow of death. Okay? There is a reason that these evil things always happen at night. Don't go party at night. Don't go to a protest at night. Stay in the house at night. Look, we live in the height of technology. You can find stuff to do. Okay? You can even get on a video chat if you're lonely. Look, I make myself available to all of you. If you're dealing with a temptation or, or a trial in your life, call me. I program your numbers into my phone. Call me, okay? You, you, you're, you, just because you're, uh, just because it's nighttime doesn't mean you have to be alone, okay? God's provided you a way out. Also, isn't it ironic? Just a month ago, we were, I was really under attack for publicly saying that masks were a public safety nuisance. Where does it really make you feel any safer that, that it, when everybody's masked, if you have to tell a cop, oh, well, the person who raped my wife, the person who kidnapped my child was one of 10,000 people in a mask. No, that's wicked. And how do you even see a predator coming when they're all masked? It, it, it's so wicked and it's so stupid. But now here it is. You know, I mean, we've been dealing with Antifa since Trump's been in office. Uh, we, we know that the terrorists so often wear masks. Gangsters have always worn masks. There is, it should be easy to identify a threat by wearing a mask, okay? And why would you want to cover your identity if you don't have something to hide? And just beyond that, from a healing aspect, I mean, uh, if, if the virus hits your mask, it's going to stay on the mask. And instead of breathing it in for a hot second, you're going to be breathing in for as long as you have the mask on. I mean, and then you're a special kind of stupid if you're driving around in the car alone with your mask on. That's just ridiculous. I mean, get a brain. Oh, we've seen it. Yes, we have seen it. I mean, but, but okay. So also, should Christians support these protests? Should Christians support these protests? The answer is no. Let me prove it. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 6. Uh, verses 14 through 17. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? You see, we Christians, our bodies are the temple of God now. Uh, for ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Glory to God. Okay, so I have photos of the top author in the Southern Baptist Convention wearing Black Lives Matter shirts. The Presbyterian Church in America has uh, their big seminary, Reformed Theological Seminary, has hired Jamar Tisby uh, to be their legal counsel, and he's a big Black Lives Matter supporter. Look, go to the Black Lives Matter website 
it, there's more about sodomy than there is being black. And uh, they all give their preferred pronouns. Half of them are so demon possessed that their preferred pronoun is they, because they're like the you know the, the legion man uh, that God that Jesus met in Gad. You know that he said, "Call me legion," because he had ten thousand demons in him. I mean, come on, God, my, my, God created the male and female. Okay, be one or the other, and be the one God gave you. Most importantly, because God knew what He was doing when He made you. You are. Grieving and even getting to the point of blaspheming the Holy Ghost when you say nuh uh to that one when you're dealing with God, bless God. Uh, also, he's uh, in Antifa. Antifa is a terrorist organization that throws human waste on prayer vigils, that throws disabled veterans out of wheelchairs, that just goes and knocks out and mob assaults random people, that blocks traffic to keep people from getting to work. If you participate in these protests, you're associating with all of this stuff. All right, so also virtue signaling. You see, don't even endorse this stuff passively or use their expressions. Because my Bible says to avoid all appearances of evil. When you are advocating for their causes and their lingo, look, do like we're doing here and express the nuances from God's word. Because God's word is perfect and it deals with all men equally. But at the same time, don't use their hashtags. Don't fall for their false narratives because you are not avoiding the appearance of evil. You are embracing the appearance of evil. Also, uh, wait for the facts to come out. You see, the man has already been arrested uh, who did this, and he's going to be convicted, I'm sure of it. So wait, wait to do a protest until after uh, the justice system pans out. Uh, James 1.19 says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. So you see, be swift to look. Whenever you hear about these instances, you know, uh, be, don't be one of these people that jumps on the bandwagon every single one and then just get wrong and wrong. And you can tell these people are given over to a hardened spirit because they're desperate to finally be right about one of these things. So they just desperately grasp on more to the next one more vigorously every time. You know, don't give yourself over to that spirit. So sit back, wait for the facts to come out, and judge the facts, and encourage others to do likewise. Slow to speak. Don't speak out on something you don't know about. And if you don't know about something, and if none of us really know about it, it's enough to say, let's not speak about this. Let's wait for the case. I'm going to speak about not speaking. That's some good stuff right there. That's good counsel. I like that. Uh, slow to wrath. You see, that means whenever one of the, even though this man is clearly a murderer, don't respond to it by going, ah, burn it down and steal the shoes. Don't do that. Be slow to wrath, you see? Which that means step back and go, oh man, I sure hope they arrest that guy. That's just wicked. I can't imagine. Uh, that would be horrible if that happened to my family or somebody I knew. I can't imagine. That's horrible. Ooh. You know, be slow to it because as we see here, he's been arrested. And also my Bible says uh, not to let the sun set on your wrath. So you know what? Even though you're mad about this, go to bed. Don't riot, okay? There you go. Problem solved. Uh, also, Proverbs uh, 18, 13. Uh, it's just a real quick verse here. Uh, he that answereth the matter before he heareth, it is a folly and a shame unto him. You see, uh, you're not... Whenever you jump on every single one of these stories, as soon as the fake news media puts it out, you're not signaling your virtue. You're, you're, you're advertising your folly. You're advertising your foolishness. You see, you're, you're telling the whole world that you are a fool who doesn't have the good sense to look into something before he, before he blabs his claptrap. Uh, so just be smarter than that. I want you to be smarter than that. And uh, also, so I want to go ahead and get into the some solutions here. And this is uh, going to be real quick for the sake of time. This is a big subject, so it's a big sermon, I know, forgive me. All right, so first off, as we get into these texts dealing with the Thessalonian aspect and the application, 
uh, you have to, whenever you interpret the Bible, use deductive reasoning. If something is not clear in the Bible, you may not always know exactly what it means, but if you use clear scripture, you can very easily roll out what it doesn't mean. Because if you try to create some new doctrine uh, or try to like take it away from the Bible to say it's not applicable, you will always inevitably create all kinds of problems where, where you might create a doctrine where the same application means Jesus sinned. You might also create some application where you can lose your salvation. You might even create a narrative that causes an unbeliever to blaspheme the Holy Ghost by repeating the stupid things that you're saying by not using this method of deductive reasoning, okay? So just be, be very, very careful not to jump to conclusions or to, uh, em or to base your doctrines off of unclear texts. Because inevitably, somewhere in the Bible, it's so big and so deep, you're going to create some very, very problematic blasphemy somewhere in God's Word. All right, so now that that's out of the way, uh, let's go back to 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, where verses 3 and 4 say, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, that and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalted himself above all that is called God, or all that is worshipped, so that he is he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Okay, so uh, I, I first want to that great falling away. That's where we get the word apostasy. The great you see a falling away is an apostasy, a falling away from the faith, a falling away from the old time religion, a falling away from sound doctrine. Uh, and now the great falling away is the one that precedes the Antichrist. The Greek word is apostasy, which is where they get apostasy. So whether you say apostasy, the great apostasy, or the great falling away, either way, you're right. Uh, so also, I just want to go ahead and clear that up. So we do learn a little bit about what that great apostasy is going to look like in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. That means that no matter how much time it takes me to teach you these doctrines, I've got to be patient with you and love you through it to teach them to you. Uh, reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Preaching is two-thirds negative, one-third positive. Reprove. That means to beat steel back into place. Rebuke. That means to tell you the hard truths. Exhort. That means to encourage you in doing the right thing. Because I need to teach you these doctrines. I need to learn these doctrines myself. And we all have to have a spirit of long-suffering with each other because we're a room full of sinners. Uh, for the time will come, and the time has come, I tell you, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. You see, but you do, the, you do the work of an evangelist. You take the gospel out. We're going to get to that in the solution of the sermon in, in just a minute. But you see, the time has come when men, will not, when men do not endorse sound doctrine. So for one thing, we know false prophets are going to be even more with us as that time approaches. But they've always been with us. We have 2 Peter 2, uh, 2 Timothy 3, and the book of Jude, which tell you all about the different operating procedures and the different types of false prophets. Being the scamster who goes into fleece widows, uh, be it the usurper, a layman who wants status, be it a false prophet there, there, who, who is a preacher who, who teaches damnable doctrines. But also, a part of a great falling away is unsaved people. Unsaved people. You see, more and more, People are growing up in church and not getting saved, and not getting saved and living for the world, turning away from the faith. More and more, this is happening. 
We, as a Christian nation, the reason everything in this country is so wicked right now is because we've had generation after generation after generation of people who grew up in church getting out of church, and now we're at the point where we're in an unchurched country that's not right with God and getting judged by God. Uh, also, weak Christians. One way a, a person can be a weak Christian is that they abide in the flesh rather than abiding in the Spirit. That they say, oh, no, no, I want to increase and Christ can, I want to, and I want to increase and Christ will have to decrease right now uh, so he can increase later. You know, oh, I need to do some other stuff before I get right with God. Even saved people will do this. But if you are a true son of God, God will chasten you and God will scourge you. You will not prosper in that trash, okay? You can like that or you can love that, but I tell you that because I love you, okay? So this is the truth right here. You see, uh, Apostle Paul, even a godly man like Apostle Paul in Romans 7 said, Because of the dual nature, his flesh, he did that which he hated in his spirit as a man of God. Okay, so also doctrines. You know, uh, Jesus did say that if you sin and teach others to do likewise, he will be called the least in the kingdom of God. Wait a minute. In the kingdom of God. Do you know what that means? That means there will even be saved preachers who will fall for the horrible trash that false prophets are teaching and that they will teach horrible doctrines that turns grace into lasciviousness. Even saved preachers. Watch out for that in this great fallen away. That's a part of it. Uh, 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, and we're almost done. Uh, verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. So this is sort of an archaic word, he who letteth will let. That means that, uh, that means hinder. So you see, right now, the only reason that we are not literally living in hell on earth is because the Holy Ghost is still restraining. You see, what are the restraints? You see, uh, it's totally blasphemy to say that after the rapture, the Holy Ghost is going to disappear. Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If God said that you're going to be sealed by the Holy Ghost when you're saved, you're always going to be sealed with the Holy Ghost when you're saved, even if it's after the rapture, okay? That's damnable heresy if you're teaching anything else. You better check yourself by the word, bless God. All right, but I do want to stress this. The Holy Ghost will cease to hinder so, in, in a way, this could be weak, lily-livered, liberal, uh, noodle-spine preachers who will not preach against sin, who will not teach sound doctrine, who don't have the guts to stand up there and tell you what to look for so that you are ready to endure the evil age. Also, uh, it, it, it could just be simply this. People who aren't going soul winning. Christians who are not sharing their faith with people. It could refer to Christians who uh, are not living the faith, and, in the, and as such, they are letting they're letting the world they're letting the devil have the world because Christ in them, the Holy Ghost in them, is not living, is not expanding, is not bearing fruit that is planting seeds all over the world. Bless God. All right, so let's go ahead and wrap up with the other application here. Romans 13, verses 1 through 5. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Look, uh, the King James says higher powers because the higher, highest power is God. Don't take this like the heretics will to say that this tells you uh, to submit to the government to take the mark of the beast or to shut down your church, or to not go soul winning, or, uh, or to not preach against sin. It says the higher powers. God is the highest power. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is, a minister, he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. 
For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience's sake. Look, if the government tells you to do something, and the Bible does not say that that thing is a sin, just do it. Okay? Uh, but it's, if, if the government's telling you to do something that's a sin, don't do that, because he's the higher power. You see, uh, I hate to go back to the Greek, but I'm going to do it. You see, uh, the higher powers, the Greek term actually uses the word princes, because, you see, uh, a, godly, a, a ruler is just a prince. God's the king, big daddy. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. But that being said, you see, uh, Hitler, Hitler was not covered under this. God didn't ordain Hitler, okay? God didn't ordain Stalin. And you know what? I'm going to get a little politically incorrect right now. God did not ordain Sheriff Chad in Tampa. You see, Sheriff Chad uh, makes a big spectacle of himself, arrests a pastor, despite his bad theology, arrests a pastor for having church when Hebrews 10.25 says, Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, uh, uh, all the more as you say the day approach it. You see, as times wax worse and worse, and we get all the closer to Jesus coming back, go to church more. Be in fellowship more. Get more preaching and more Bible into you, bless God. But you see, this guy, he arrested a pastor. And the next day, he releases a bunch of criminals to protect them from COVID-19. You see, and one of these criminals murdered somebody. That blood is on Sheriff Chad's hand. And, and it gets even worse. He holds a press conference with all the press there, making a mockery of it. Had touching the prosecutor, him and the prosecutor all rubbing their hands on the same podium, and they bring in, this is, this is pure politics, okay? This is pure politics, and I know this because I've seen it. They bring in a, a rich white pastor from Idlewild and a, a poor neighborhood black pastor from Tampa. Uh, so Ken Witten at Idlewild and some black Pentecostal pastor all standing there. So you got the, the rich white and the poor black standing there side by side thanking the sheriff for banning church. Okay? You see that? And making a mockery of it. Okay? And, and this, is, this isn't just a Democrat issue. I was doing some work with the Romney campaign in 2012, and I was talking to this nice, good, well-spoken young black man who was in law school, and I, I had to step away for a second to do something. I was like, I'll be right back. When I got back, he wasn't there, and I found out what happened was they had taken him onto the stage uh, to be literally right over Mitt Romney's left shoulder for the video camera. I mean, this is, this is sheer politics, okay? This is what politicians do. They don't care about you. They don't care about the races. It's all about perception and self-gratification and self-advancement. They don't care about any of us. But you see, look at it this way. The Founding Fathers. Do you know why the Founding Fathers, I wouldn't vote Thomas Jefferson into church membership, but I would have voted for him for president. You see, he came up in a godly age, and because it was a godly age, he recognized that good godly people make good citizens and that freedom cannot exist without a godly population. And to be, go further than that, he had to govern by the standards of God's word because he was accountable in a constitutional republic. And as, uh, you can say a lot of bad stuff about this country right now because there was only one country with a perfect law and it was God's law in Israel. But at the same time, Look, you see, we have, we're not in a democracy, we're in a constitutional republic. As wicked as the country gets, do you know what the constitutional republic is? That means God has a veto power over everybody's stupid decisions. That is what a constitutional republic involves. But, and Trump, you see, Trump, well, oh yeah, I support religious liberty, I support the Second Amendment, I support freedom of speech, I oppose abortion. But he wants to legalize sodomy worldwide, okay? Uh, he's bringing in Paula White and Kenneth Copeland and all these people into the White House. Uh, look, okay, Trump is just a reflection of the times. If we were a godly country again, Trump would not have heretics in the White House and would not be promoting sodomy around the world. You can lock that, you can love that, okay? And the, but even worse, how, considering that the church... And, 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 the, and the people of God, the body of Christ, are the conscience of the nation. How bad is it when you have liberal mainliners who aren't saved, who go out promoting all the wickedness of the world in the name of Christ? 
How much more when liberal neo-evangelicals, who even some of them are saved, buy into the me mental and emotional manipulation of the godless, wicked society to promote uh, a moderated form of wickedness? No wonder this great falling away will allow a wicked ruler to rise up because everything's going to go to hell in a handbasket to proceed. So what's the solution? You know what the solution is? The Great Commission. Go and teach all nations. You know, that means, you, know what, you want to know what the cure to racism is? Hey, you want to know what the cure to racism is? Go and knock on doors and find how black people are far more receptive to the gospel than white people. Yeah, you're going to thank God for a black person answering that door sometimes. You know what I mean? Because you're just sick of having white people slam the door in your face. You see, that's going to be the cure. You see, uh, uh, that is the cure. And also, uh, my, my Bible says that there's neither Greek nor Jew, slave nor bond, male nor female, nor, uh, nor Hebrew, nor Scythian, nor German, nor Kraut nor Polish, nor African, nor Russian, nor Chinese, nor Japanese, nor Korean, uh, uh, nor Ethiopian, uh, nor Ugandan, nor Indian, uh, nor Eskimo, that we're all one in Christ. That's what it says in the original Greek, okay? All right, so that being said, what's the solution? Love, get people saved. Share the gospel with people. Get them saved. And we, and God, bring in every, people from all nations and tribes and tongues together in this peculiar, set-apart nation. If you want to cure racism in this country, get, them right, get right with God. If you want to have equal justice under the law, demand biblical justice. And know what the Bible says about it. Let's pray. Oh God, we love you. Thank you for your book. We love you so much. Help us to see souls saved. Uh, grow the church for your glory's sake. Rise up fire-breathing preachers who are going to faithfully teach the counsel of God without respect of persons and without the lust of their bellies. And just, Lord, let us see uh, revival in these last days. Call out a remnant to yourself and empower us to be your vessels and to give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.